Buckholtz Plant Introductions, Part 17. In about 2002, Haruko and I were in Japan visiting nurseries, private plant collections, and public gardens. I was charged to find myself in a fabulous world of plants and plant people. While at the same time, I was dragging with jet lag and squinting from the fierce oriental sun. Haruko led me by the arm, constantly, and had the thankless task to translate, which involved tolerating my demand for her to be sharp and quick. Lest I miss out on important information, such as the spelling of plant names or stories about their origin. The following winter, packages would arrive at the nursery with apparently all paperwork in proper order. One item of great interest was a weeping, pink flowered Sterix japonicus with the invalid name of Pink Pendula. The plant might have been known by a different Japanese name, and the gifter was just trying to be helpful with the translation, but I never did learn of its origin or prior identification. I remember seeing some stock plants trained to be eight foot tall while the branches cascade in a neat, narrow manner. A few years later, we propagated the fast-growing cultivar by grafting on the hot callus and by the soft wood cuttings rooted in summer. While not absolutely sure, I suppose that I was the first in America to grow the pink weeper, so I introduced it as such, Momo, Pink, Shadari, Weeping. In production, Styrax japonicus Momo Shadari was problematic with summer cuttings rooting fairly well, but then faltering when potted up a year or two later. The grafts were more successful, more vigorous and uniform, but we always seemed behind on staking because the branch leader was too soft and easily damaged if trained too early, but then could quickly turn stiff and uncooperative. We sold a modest amount for a few years, but sales were never strong. I guess because potential customers didn't grasp the meaning of Momo Shidari. Maybe sales were slow because we were primarily known for maples and conifers, with a third group of everything else, often sporadic with too many of one item, and not enough of another. Tiring of the Styrex challenge, I decided to sell my container stock to a different propagator a larger company who's optimistic about the cultivar's future. Little did I know at the time that the company would take Momo Shadari in a different, illegal direction by renaming it Marley's Pink Parasol and slapping on a patent. That was illegal because the snowbell was already out of the barn, for we had marketed it for at least four years prior to the patent. I'd continue to graft a small number from an old stock plant in the garden under the name of Momo Shadari. But my small numbers are not a threat to the big boys. I chuckle that the American icon Martha Stewart likes Marley's pink parasol so much that they line her driveway at her Mount Kisco area New York garden location. I know where she lives, and I imagine some fun if I could point out that her name is wrong but she would probably call security and throw me off the property. Another Styrax japonicus was sent to me from Japan a few years later under the name Pink Dwarf. The tree itself forms a dense, irregular shrub to about four foot tall by three foot wide in ten years, but it easily can be kept more dwarf or shaped into a pyramidal fashion with pruning. Believing that it was new to the American market, I christened it as Pink Trinket in about 2008. It's a delight in May with clear pink snowbell flowers born in abundance. A third Styrax to arrive from Japan was labeled as just dwarf. It is far more compact than pink trinket, and the cutie is absolutely loaded with pearl white blossoms, making a perfect one gallon flowering shrub in just two years from the graft. It was named and introduced as Snowdrops in 2008, the same time that we introduced Pink Trinket. One of the risks of my plant stories is that I'm likely not correct 100% of the time, where I suppose that I'm growing the first or the largest of something. 
but I know that I'm correct most of the time. When I look back at my introductions, or supposed introductions, it's an interesting story of horticultural history, but one where I was lucky more than skilled, where I just found myself in the right place at the right time, and the generosity of others from around the world made a lot of it possible. One special plant gifter from Japan was Akira Shibimichi, and he, now in his 80s, also received new plants from me. He was fond of my wife Haruko and was willing to share many trees with her, so I just stood back and kept my mouth shut, never wanting to come across as over-aggressive. Better to let Haruko work her subtle magic with the old geezer nurseryman, just as she worked me before. Imagine my delight when a weeping Stordia arrived at the nursery, labeled Stordia monodelphia pendula. Once again, I realized that the name wasn't sustainable or valid since the Latin pendula was no longer hoil for the cult of our designation since the 1950s. And again, I think that Essan's pendula name was something never used in Japan for the new selection. But for my part, I was just happy with the idea that a weeping stordia existed at all. And that here, I was, in America, in possession of such an ornamental treasure, no matter what it was called. Later, I tagged this introduction as Fuji Shidari, since it was a white-flowered weeping tree. In recent years, I used a fantastic cultivar as trading bait with other nurserymen, collectors, for their exclusive trees. Our commercial production is still limited. However, since the rootstock itself costs a fortune, and the graft success is never very high, so, Fuji Shidari remains a snob plant, all the more because no one else is positioned to supply it. Stordia monodelphia is commonly known as the tall stordia, or the orange bark stordia. The latter name is obvious, but tall is odd because it's still a relatively small tree, almost never exceeding 25 foot tall. The Japanese Korean native's name honors the 16th century Scottish botanist John Stort. So you can see that there was a mix up in the spelling. The specific epithet, monodelphia, is derived from the Greek word monos, meaning one, and adelphos, meaning brother in reference to the statements being united. So typical of the old botanist to epithetize a plant for a minor botanical detail that most of us would never notice. My Stordia monodelphia Fujishidari is brilliant in autumn with orange-red foliage, but I think I appreciate it most in winter when I can enjoy the flaky orange bark. Keonanthus, the fringe tree, is encountered in horticulture with two primary species, Rituses from China and Virginicus from Eastern North America, and I grew both species early in my career. They form large, multi-stem shrubs, notable for narrow strap-like flowers in June-July. The white flowers gave rise to the generic name from Greek, Kion for snow, and Anthos for flower. I originally purchased seedlings of Chianathus virginicus as I preferred it over its Chinese counterpart, and after that initial purchase, we would root softwood cuttings in summer from our stock. Our propagants were vigorous and easy to grow, but overall the market considers it a cheap shrub, so we eventually abandoned the production to focus on more high end plants. At one point in my snow flower affair, I noticed one seedling that displayed a dark, almost pure black shoots, and my intention was that I would propagate from that one clone only, so it was given a cultivar name of Black Stem. I wasn't familiar with random seedlings of Keonanthus virginicus, so maybe the Black Stem feature is not all that unique for the species. When I recollect my plant introduction, it basically reveals my autobiography with many trees making only a brief appearance. The same, as with black stem, occurred with Parochia persica, select, except that it was the foliage, not the stems that looked unique. 
We discontinued with raising Parochia Persica seedlings and focused on rooting the selected version, a luxurious clone where the fresh spring leaves displayed more prominent purple margins than the type. Select was not a great cultivar name, probably meant to be an in-house description only, except it was never improved upon when the first sales were made. Our market was decent for the ironwood tree, especially since the durable Parochia persica species is hardy to negative 30 Fahrenheit USDA zone 4 and is a tree with fantastic autumn color. At the same time, we also grew the more narrow Parochia persica vanessa, which was considered more garden worthy, but at Buckles Nursery it formed a vase shaped canopy that was still quite large. When Parochia persica Persian Spire came on the market, I recognized that its narrow pillar shape would be the preferred cultivar for our company, so Vanessa and Select are no longer in production. I'm on the record of disapproving of the use of people's names for cultivars, and yet I have done so myself. Dorothy, a wonderful 90-year-old gardening woman from Vancouver, Washington had a spontaneous Dogwood hybrid between Cornus florida and Cornus nutellii in her yard. The tree was lovely in flower, and so was Dorothy, so I propagated it to her delight and named it for her. I even thought about dating her, in spite of our age difference. But then I had just met my current wife, and Haruko's flesh and smile proved the stronger attraction. Dorothy has passed away now but her dogwood remains, and therefore, so does she. Sometime in the 1990s, conifer expert Greg Williams of Vermont sent me scions of a magnolia witch's broom, I think from Pennsylvania, that developed on a large magnolia X solangiana, or at least Greg thought it was the host's identity. I skipped the specific epithet when I propagated it because I wasn't certain if it was truly X Solangiana, and neither was Greg. Unfortunately, Gifter Greg went reclusive in that decade and never gave me guidance about a cultivar's name, so I flippantly chose Kiki's Broom because my young children, half Japanese, were then fascinated with Hayao Miyazaki's animated movie about a cute Japanese pixie witch who provided a delivery service via a magic flying broom. Honestly, I never wanted to be the namer of this cultivar. It was neither my duty nor privilege to do so. But I filled the void because customers were impressed with the dwarf, dense shrub when it was covered with blossoms in April. A dozen years later, I discovered it probably was the same plant that nurserymen Piet Vergelt was growing at his nursery in Holland, but one marketed by a different trade name, and who knows if it is now at more locations, each with possibly a different name. For what it's worth, Kiki's Broom probably takes precedence over the other names. I propagated, named, and introduced Davidia and Valucrata Platts Variegated about 30 years ago. It was a big mistake, and it showed my complete ignorance about the genus. A large dove tree was growing in the renowned garden of Jane Platt, Portland, Oregon, and I was given permission to harvest scions. The leaves were basically green, with a great deal of cream white, which did not burn in full sun. I encountered their specimen before I was aware that other variegated Davidias even existed, so I thought I was quite a coup to be the first to introduce the novelty. The problem was that my young plants never displayed the white portions as did the old specimen. Later I learned that flower bracts and a tree leaves are basically just two forms of the same material, so my young propagules weren't old enough to flower or develop the white leaf color. I apologize to anyone who purchased my non-variegated plats variegated. Those interested in learning more about the purpose of Davidia's flower bracts can access an excellent article which appeared in Arnoldia on February 15, 2001, 
Volume 68, Issue 3. An interesting oak seedling arose in our Far East garden in about 2002, and it featured butter yellow leaves. We were already growing the Golden Quercus Rober, English Oak, Concordia, but my stock was a considerable distance from the new seedling, and in fact the nearest Quercus Rober was Purpurea. In the same vicinity of my yellow sapling was a dozen or so green arousals, none of which interested me, but I transplanted the yellow one and later propagated and named it Butterbee. We sold Butterbee for about a decade before I admitted to myself that it was indistinguishable from the Concordia cultivar. The latter, an old selection raised in Van Gert's nursery in Ghent, Belgium, as early as 1843. I regretted the Butterbee introduction as unnecessary and inappropriate, but at least I didn't produce many into the trade. A few years ago, I was hounded by a member of the International Oak Society, of which I am not a member, that I should, of course, submit a foliage sample, or a plant itself, and a valid scientific description so that it could be properly registered. I didn't feel the need to comply, especially since I had already discontinued the Concordia lookalike. The oakster persisted so I eventually sent one small plant, of only two that remained at the nursery. I never heard back from him, if he received it or not, or any thanks at all for my trouble and expense, so I concluded that I didn't bother further with the Oak Society. I'll conclude today's blog with Cornus Cusa Ayasaya, a variegated oriental dogwood that I discovered as a seedling in a group of purchased rootstock. It's in various collections now, including European, but the consensus is that it's nowhere the equal to my Cornus Cusa Summer Fun. See Buckoat's Plant Introductions Part 3. The name Ayasaya translates, more or less, to peaceful beauty in Japanese, according to wife Haruko, but she squirmed now, as well as 20 years ago when I pressed her for a translation. I reminded her that she named it previously, but she didn't remember that event. But I do, since I thought it rhymed nicely with my youngest daughter's name, Saya. Aya Saya is a wonderful name, but I now can see that the plan itself does not warrant further production. I've said it before. It's unwise to name a plant after a friend or a family member, because there's no guarantee that either will live up to the accolade. If you are a specialty nursery or boutique garden center wanting the rare and exceptional plants your customers love, register as a wholesale customer on buckoltsnursery.com today.